Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Uh, well, there's a lot of confusion out there about um, getting a diagnosis of dementia. Which type of uh, dementia does a person actually have? Um, on Being Patient, we are really trying to understand what the differences are and how different neurodegenerative diseases are related in order for you to understand um, uh, how to get a better diagnosis for yourself or your loved one. So I'm so happy today uh, to have two different voices on the matter. Um, we have Dr. Zoltan Mari. He's from uh, Cleveland Clinic's Lou Ruvo Center and uh, a specialist on Parkinson's. Um, and joining us as well is John Gastel. His uh, father, his late father, passed away in 2012 of Parkinson's dementia. So thank you both very much for being with us uh, today. Um, I want to start with you, um, Dr. Mari, just because uh, we often hear Parkinson's and dementia mentioned together, um, but yet they're really different diseases. So can you explain to us um, really what the difference or the similarities are? Thank you for having me and thank you for that question. And I'd like to start saying that dementia is a syndrome. It's not a disease. It is more like a uh, set of symptoms that can be caused by a variety of different etiologies and Parkinson's disease is one of them. And then when it happens, uh, when dementia develops in the setting of Parkinson's disease, then we call it PDD or Parkinson's disease dementia. Having said that, you can have Parkinson's disease and live a long life and not have dementia. So it's not an absolute inevitable event, but many patients, the, the longer they live with Parkinson's and the later they develop it in the first place, will experience dementia at some point during the course of their Parkinson's disease. So is a, is a good way to liken it to is they really start out on different paths within the brain, but in the end, they, they come together? So again, dementia is just a uh, description of um, impaired cognitive performance, memory problems, executive dysfunction, other cognitive um, uh, failings. And uh, when you have that, you, as you mentioned in the introduction, we have to figure out what's causing it. Now, Parkinson's disease is a neuropathological entity and the clinical entity. So there is a, an underlying pathology that happens in the brain. It on, it's going on uh, affecting our brain cells, usually years and years before any symptoms occur. And you would know that you have Parkinson's disease. And then once the motor symptoms develop, the disease will progress. It is a progressive disease, gets worse over time. At some point, the underlying pathological process that I mentioned earlier that is happening in the brain could reach and affect some of the networks and parts of the brain which are responsible for memory, cognition, mentation, executive functions. And so that's when you, you will start experiencing the symptoms of dementia at some point. So let's take, I mean, Alzheimer's disease, which is perhaps known as the most common dementia. Um, and Alzheimer's starts out uh, in the hippocampus, the area responsible for memory or in the frontal lobe part portions of the brain, whereas Parkinson's starts in a different part. It's called the, um, is it the ba ba basal ganglia? Is that correct? Basal ganglia. Yeah, the basal ganglia of the brain. Um, Yet, you know, if you, in the end, maybe see symptoms of the diseases, um, do they look quite sim similar in, in the patient? I think you, you're making excellent observations, which we refer to as a clinical pathological correlation. And what that means is that the different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. And when they are attacked by a neurodegenerative disorder, such as Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, the way those different parts of the brain are attacked at what time course, to what extent, will have an impact as how you would, would look clinically. 
um, as, and you're absolutely right. The uh, well-known part of the brain that tends to go first or is susceptible to the Parkinson pathology early in the disease is called the nigrostriatal okay. pathway. And that's part of the basal ganglia. And that's why motor symptoms such as slowing, just losing some coordination, dexterity, becoming stiff, losing balance, and sometimes tremor are oftentimes the early motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease and not so much dementia or cognitive impairment. But that doesn't mean that higher order parts of the brain, you mentioned the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe, which includes the hippocampus and other, other networks are immune to Parkinson's. They are not involved early on. They are relatively resistant to the underlying pathological process for why they are only going to be involved later in the disease and to, not to the same extent as for instance in Alzheimer's where they are affected and attacked early on in the disease and to a greater extent. Okay, and sorry, John, to keep you waiting. I didn't mean to, um, but I, I want to get the basics down because I think there's a lot of confusion over how they're they're related. So, um, John, tell tell us a little bit about your dad, your father, and um, what what Parkinson's dementia looked like uh, for you know on his journey. So first, a little family context, which is uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was exposed to Alzheimer at a very early age. Uh, my grandmother was the first uh, one who would call uh, you know, several times a day and tell us the same stories. So we started to learn about it when we were little, um, but then other women of her generation also had it. And so it was something that was considered very common in our family, Alzheimer's. So now go forward several decades and um, dad started um, declining a little bit physically, uh, but not in a way that was noticeable. He had always had kind of a funny way of moving. And so as his gait became a little more problematic, nobody noticed. Finally, uh, he and my mother were just at a party and a doctor asked, so how long has it been since your husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's? And, you know, she got a little defensive. It's like, well, of course he doesn't have Parkinson's. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And the doctor was like, oh no, um, you know, it's quite advanced. Um, and so my point being that it was so gradual that it really didn't it really didn't register. I would say the same thing started uh, with what well, ultimately uh, he was diagnosed with uh, Lewy body dementia. Um, the dementia was similar in that, you know, he was always an absent-minded professor. So you know, we were maybe a little more forgiving of some of the early signs of trouble. Um, and then the Parkinson's <laughs> made you wonder, you know, am I is he having trouble communicating with me because of a motor difficulty? Or is he actually having trouble forming thoughts and communicating? And so, again, we didn't see that coming uh, probably until it was well underway. So it started with the physical difficulty and the motor neurological uh, ultimately manifested in the dementia. Okay, and you know, you bring up a really good point, and Dr. Mari, I want to I want to throw this to you because there's a lot of confusion out there about getting diagnosed, right? I mean, we've had people on who were giving given a diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's and lived thinking they had early onset Alzheimer's for five years, only to discover it was Lewy body dementia. Um, so. I'm curious about um, a couple of things. One is, I, I do believe you could draw a Venn diagram or, uh, around a lot of these neurological diseases, as you pointed out before, you know, as you progress, they impact different parts of the brain, uh, brain and, and eventually merge. But, you know, for someone like John's father, who uh, is, is Parkinson's more closely related to Lewy body, as I've been told, um, than it is to Alzheimer's disease? And, and what is the relationship between those types of dementia? And what do we need to know in order to get a, a, an accurate diagnosis? That, that was a, a, a bunch of questions and they are all excellent questions. And uh, it is on the minds of, of, of patients that we see every day. And let me start saying that there is no absolute diagnostic biomarker for any one of these disorders. So and it's not an easy test. Like there are disorders, including my field of movement disorders, Huntington's disease, for instance, uh, which also can cause dementia. You can do a genetic test and know if somebody has it or doesn't have it. And then, then it is a 100% certainty, which call it, we, we call it absolute 
biomarker. There is no such absolute diagnostic biomarker with 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity for any of these other neurodegenerative disorders. So I always encourage, uh, I always encourage patients to um, seek a subspecialty expert on the field who can piece together clinical signs, history uh, properly to arrive at a high certainty clinical diagnosis and also with supportive data, including imaging, neuropsychological evaluation and other, other data. So there is hope. We are not 100%, even, even the experts are not 100%, but in terms of the diagnostic accuracy, experts who do this and only do this all the time will have a, a much greater chance of, of getting it right. But you are right that as time goes on, um, usually our ability to accurately diagnose will improve because we have the luxury of looking at the time course of a disease, which can distinguish uh, one from another, which could look very similar in the very early stages. So you asked about uh, the pathology um, and uh, the, the underlying pathology that I previously described that, that kills the neurons in the brain. Um, is very similar between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease. That process is referred to as synucleinopathy. And uh, what it is, is that there is one protein in the brain, which we all have, called alpha synuclein, and something bad happens to it because in a normal state, it is part of our brain. We need it. We uh, physiologically rely on it, but something happens to it for it starting misfolding it, it has a different shape and that makes it toxic it will not be water soluble it will make little clumps inside the cells or or in some cases in the glia there are synucleinopathies such as multiple system atrophy which is another neurodegenerative disorder where these cytoplasmic glial formations uh, of, of synuclein happen in the glial cells but the bottom line is that that's the underlying reason why everything uh, goes ARI and eventually leads to cellular death. Alzheimer's disease is not a synucleinopathy. It is also a proteinopathy where a different protein, the protein tau, uh, will do the damage. And that's what uh, starts the neurodegeneration. That's why it's called tauopathy. And there are many other neurodegenerative disorders in that group as well. Frontotemporal dementia is one of them, progressive supranuclear palsy, and, and the list goes on and on for somewhat rarer dementia syndromes, but those are the so-called tauopathies, whereas Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, and multiple system atrophy are the synucleinopathies. So does that mean that certain treatments for Parkinson's will work on Lewy body dementia? That's another good question. So the short answer is yes. Um, they are uh, they are very much overlapping when you were mentioning the Venn diagrams in terms of their clinical manifestations, how they look clinically, the symptoms uh, can be very similar. Uh, it, it, it is very difficult to tell apart, especially in the early stages, Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson's disease is not always the same either. You know, there are patients who start the cognitive impairment earlier in the disease. Some patients have tremor, others don't. Some patients are asymmetric, some are not as much. So there's a great variability even within the Parkinson's disease groups and so is in the Lewy body dementia group. And there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, but having said that, um, the, the, the treatment for both is so-called symptomatic. Unfortunately, at, a, at this moment, we don't have anything that would interfere with the synucleinopathy itself, which is the is sort of the root cause of all the problems or the neuro, neurodegeneration or the related neuroinflammation. So we don't have any approved or proven treatment that can do anything with those cause processes. But then we look at the symptoms and we have treatments for the symptoms. And for instance, uh, I mentioned the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system. There is a dopamine deficit. Dopamine is a neurochemical that the brain cells use to chat with one another. And there is not enough of that in both of these diseases. So some dopamine-based symptomatic treatments will help Parkinson's disease as well as diffuse Lewy body or uh, dementia with Lewy body disease patients. And also if you have cognitive impairments, 
Uh, so I mentioned PDD is the Parkinson's disease dementia complex, sim very similar to Lewy body dementia. There are some medications to improve memory and cognition, which will work in both physical therapy, occupational therapy, antidepressant treatments, and the list goes on and on. There is a lot more, I would say, similar in the clinical management of these diseases than different. Okay, so and and John, tell us um, a bit about your dad. What were the symptoms um, of Louis? But I mean, I I've always thought of Louis body dementia. The hallucinations come first. Um, a lot of uh, people we've spoken to, the misdiagnosis comes because sometimes those hallucinations are really hard to identify. They're not necessarily you know vivid, lively figures coming out of the wall, but rather more subtleties like something sweet tasting salty or something salty tasting sweet. So um, tell us a little bit about, about the circumstances of your dad's Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body. Uh, what were the, what, what did you first notice and, and what were some of the treatments that he was seeking? Sure. Well, first, Deborah, let me just say, I, I love pairing uh, the case of a single patient, my, my father, with Dr. Mari's general knowledge of the subject, because I, I teach statistics and he used a word that's very near and dear to me, which is variance. There's so much variance, there's so much variability. So what is Parkinson's? Well, Parkinson's, as you said, it's, it's a big circle and there's a ton of different things within it. So my father was a geologist, right? He was a scientist his whole life. Uh, he was a field geologist. So he was climbing mountains, running around, being crazy, cracking terrible dad jokes. And so when Parkinson's came to him, um, it was that, that sort of freedom of movement was the first thing that you started to see go. Um, late in his life, I uh, got to travel with um, him and my mother to uh, Central America and see Mayan ruins and so on. He had become fascinated with archeology span late in his career. And you could see that the Parkinson's was, was accelerating the decline that he had to go soon, right? If this was something he was gonna do in his life, he had to do it soon, right? Um, and so we went on that trip, <laughs> really the last possible chance uh, and movement was so difficult for him, but cognitively, he was absolutely sharp. He was hilarious when he was on, but he would kind of come and go through the day, right? He'd be better in the morning, worse at night. And on a couple nights on that trip uh, in the evening, he, he really caused some of the other guests on that trip to, to almost panic a little. Like this is not the same guy who was you know, walking around at the base of a pyramid with us earlier today. He seems really lost. Um, and so as that accelerated, um, things got, uh, got tougher for him. Um, and to the point that the Parkinson's and the dementia were starting to, to merge, that's when you weren't sure again about whether there was a, a motor difficulty with understanding him or whether he was truly talking about something else, like he couldn't hold the conversation. I, I, I want to say a word about treatments. So when Dr. Mari talks about treatments, he's principally talking about medical treatments. But if you ask him, he'd tell you, well, there's actually a lot of things that aren't medical that you can do. And one of the things that comes to my mind is the Tremble Clefs Choir that my mom would take dad to, where he could sing. He, he, you, know, you couldn't understand a word he said, and then he'd sing some terrible old song like Oh, oh Susanna, right? The kind of stuff that would torture us on long field trips, uh, singing from the front of the car. Um, and that is a kind of treatment, right? It would give him some confidence and self-esteem, some community, because it would be with fellow Parkinson's patients um, who varied in their singing ability aside from neuromuscular difficulties. Um, but but did, he, did he have the hallucinations at all? Did he experience hallucination? Really, I, only very late, uh, late in his life did we start to wonder about that. What he had was incredibly vivid dreams. Um, and Dr. Mari and I got the chance to meet each other in a preparation for this interview. And we talked about the fact that this was not a negative for him, right? This was amazing. And he, I remember uh, my sister relating that in the hospital once, he, he made her write down everything he could remember because this dream was incredible, right? And it was only, like I said, very much later when I remember when his, his brother, his one sibling came to visit um, and Uncle Ray got so frustrated because there was only a brief window where he felt like their conversation was synced up. And it, it felt almost as though Gordon, my dad, had, had gone off into another conversation, was maybe talking about something completely unrelated. And whether that was a hallucination or a confusion or so on, it was incredibly hard to tell once the Parkinson's made his speech so difficult to parse. 
because it reminds you of what linguistics has always taught, which is you know, language is just arbitrary sounds. And the only reason, Deborah, you and I understand each other is because we can see the sentence that the person is talking within and the word makes sense. So when you're not even sure what he's talking about, it's incredibly hard to understand the English language uh, through a, a Parkinson's distortion. Okay. And I, um, yeah, that's, it, it, that does really highlight how complex um, these neurodegenerative diseases can be, you know, they don't necessarily follow a script that's say that's easily diagnosable. Um, Dr. Mari, I, I, a question has come in and I, I admit, I don't really understand the answer to this because I have friends who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's who are now, they got um, what is called, I is always often to refer to as the surgery. Um, I know that there's different types of um, treatments going on. Focused ultrasound is one of them. Um, but can you actually stop Parkinson's um, in its tracks if you catch it early enough and you give the right type of treatment, whether it be surgery or something else? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, that question is also asked very commonly in the clinic and of, co of course very relevant because um, as um, uh, you know John discussed as well, there are many non pharmacological uh, interventions and treatments and it's, it's truly a multidisciplinary effort, but all that is to to make the symptoms more bearable. Um, the disability is less biting and, and less tangible and sort of uh, the quality of life better. And so these are all referred to as symptomatic treatments, which do not alter the course of the disease and do not interfere with that underlying pathology that I discussed before. And that is the holy grail. That is what everyone is trying to get to and finally solve. So to answer your questions, we don't have such treatments yet. But there is tremendous effort and investment of research dollars uh, throughout the world in trying to resolve that. And, and, and I think that we are making some progress. I, I think there are some very promising uh, preclinical results and ongoing clinical trials to that, that effect, where the goal is to find, not necessarily stop it in its tracks completely, so halt the progression, but just slow the progression. And in other words, if you are losing X amount of ground in 10 years, we want you to lose half of that in 10 years. And that would be slowing down the progression and that would be a breakthrough. I think we are close. We are not quite that, there yet, but the potential of that in the future, maybe in our lifetime, would be to catch the disease even earlier than the symptoms first manifest. There are so-called prodromal states which are certain signs that will increase your likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease later, sometimes years later. And if we had a way to completely halt the progression and applied it at that stage, then Parkinson's disease would never develop. And, um, and that f it, it, it would prevent disease globally in the future, uh, just like vaccines prevent infect infectious diseases. So coming back to the question about procedures, surgeries, and interventions, as you mentioned, there are several, and they are all invasive, but all of them are symptomatic as well. Just like I mentioned with the medications, the, the music therapy, the choir singing, the physical, occupational, mental health therapy, all of these things will help certain symptoms. And we have to combine these and individualize it to each, And because you mentioned that uh, Parkinson patients can be variable, and they are. And what is the most important disability for one patient is something else for the other patient. So we use these modalities to optimize care, but uh, the surgery is no different in that they are also symptomatic, and they we have to use very uh, careful judgment as to which patients are good candidates because not it's a, a lot of. Uh, uh, patients think about deep brain stimulation surgery as, well, if my disease gets to a certain milestone, if it gets severe enough or I reach a stage, then automatically that would be the stage where DBS should be done. And that's not the case. We have to evaluate every candidate who is referred for DBS, look for their specific symptoms and make a judgment call if it is the right choice for them. 
Mm -hmm. the, we're getting a question in here from um, a, a viewer who is asking, she says, my dad has dementia undiagnosed, but started with hallucinations, mumbles, where we can't understand, but during some parts of the day, you wouldn't even know he had dementia. Why does um, uh, different times of the day make a difference? Like why? So, and I actually have to admit, I have experienced this with my own mom who has, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And some days I'm like, oh, she's doing really well today and other days not so. So do we know the reason why um, with neurodegeneration, some days you have good days and others bad? Uh, excellent question. And I would like to uh, start saying that when John described this so-called intraday variation as an, as an early and prominent observation, uh, it always should uh, raise um, the suspicion for uh, uh, Lewy body dementia. It's it's a it's a very well known. It it happens much more with Lewy body dementia than other dementias, and so does the early hallucination. So this uh, person who's asking the questions uh, hits on two of those uh, important uh, features that generally uh, is characteristic or points to uh, Lewy body dementia. But to, to the question as to why is the variability, because the intraday variability, again, is a very classical feature for Lewy body dementia, but you have variability, like one day you are like a different person from the other day. And why is that? So that speaks to the complexity of cognitive performance is not a one dimensional uh, a linear matter. It is affected by your electrolytes, your fluid balance, your perfusion to the brain, how much you ate, how much you slept, uh, maybe a, a small virus is is running through through your your body. So there are so many other factors that normal people who have a what we call is healthy cognitive reserve will not notice because their reserve will balance for it. Like if I had bilateral pneumonia and I had a, a, a fever of 105 and I was dehydrated, I would be hallucinating probably. But to get there, it would take a lot going wrong with my internal homeostasis, my fluid balance, the temperature of my brain. A lot of things must go wrong for it to decompensate. Well, people with cognitive impairment and neurodegenerative disorders don't have a big cognitive reserve. It takes very little for them to decompensate. And those factors that I mentioned uh, may, may all or any one of those or in combination can be responsible for these fluctuations. And I would say that the most common, in my opinion, is probably perfusion of the brain, because that can be affected by body position, your hydration levels. Again, you and I, it's not going to be noticed because we compensate for it. Yeah. But it will be causing uh, clinically relevant changes in cognition for somebody who is walking on a thin ice. Right. Okay. We're getting a, a ton of questions all of a sudden, but um, John, do you want to talk a little bit about the symptom variability that you saw with your dad? Yeah, I, I, I think a, a point of emphasis that you've really set up, Deborah, in pairing me with Dr. Mari is um, that we can distinguish the diagnosis and prognosis from the patient who shows up to the doctor's office from the person who lives their entire life. And uh, so when we talk about the different symptoms that can indicate one thing or another, anytime you, as a, as a lay person going online, looking at a list of here are the symptoms of Lewy body dementia, what I want to encourage is again, remembering that you're dealing with a person uh, that website or WebMD or whatever has, is trying to generalize across all persons. So for example, going back to my father, remember he was a geologist, he studied Baja California. Uh, he was constantly paying attention to his world. Uh, he became an amateur botanist, very amateur, um, and uh, was fascinated by the culture and history of Mexico and all these things. And it, it, he never lost that drive. So, you know, apathy, one of the symptoms. Well, he doesn't have that. I guess he doesn't, well, no. He was never gonna be apathetic. No disease could handle right. him, right? How about depression? Well, he was always kind of depressed, frankly. I, I, I mean, he would kind of go in and out. He became more optimistic. He became sweeter. I mean, it was the change that alarmed us. Yeah. So and not so much, you know, the checking off depression on the list. It was, wow, okay, dad, dad seems really different. He's kind of a sweetheart now. What happened? Well, you bring up an important point. And I remember speaking to a neurologist about this saying, oh, I can never remember anyone's name or face. And they're like, well, if you can never, if you always could do that, 
then that's okay. But it's when you could do that and you couldn't do that, you're noticing the change, right? And um, so you bring up a very important point, which is, you know, we're all different and we all have different capabilities. And so one symptom may not be as pronounced in um, your father as it is in, in someone else. Um, Dr. Mari, we're getting a lot of questions. Um, I think this one in particular um, is, can you diagnose, um, uh, can you diagnose can you see Lewy body dementia on a PET scan like you can in, in the case of Alzheimer's when you're looking for the plaques and tangles? Um, can you see it? What, how, how can, you know, are there any scans or tests out there that can give you a definitive um, diagnosis for Lewy body? Yes. So uh, that, this, uh, again, ties back to the uh, previous conversation on uh, diagnostic biomarkers and how we diagnose these disorders and what methods we, we have and how, how we measure disease in general. And, and that kind of relates to um, uh, John's uh, excellent comment in that uh, when we take, uh, we, when we see patients in the clinic, that's, uh, we call it ecologically, um, uh, you know, suboptimal or invalid because that's not their normal environment. And so we are developing new technologies that can monitor patients in their home, in their lives lives through, through apps and other ways that will add a lot more data to understand what, what they look like in their actual environments. And so that would be so-called ecologically valid. But coming back to these, the scans, the answer is um, uh, while these disorders, for the most part, are diagnosed clinically, which means that a clinician such as myself or, or a cognitive neurologist for dementing disorders would gather all the information information, take the history and, and, and do an exam and use some criteria to see if the patient meets those criteria for a clinical diagnosis. There are confirmatory tests which include imaging and for instance, in the case of dementing disorders uh, and, um, and, and Lewy body dementia, uh, a brain um, um, uh, glucose, um, uh, 6-hydroxyglucose um, uh, uh, PET scan, positron emission uh, tomography um, that, um, that will light up the parts of the brain uh, depending on or based on their metabolism. So it's a metabolic scan with, uh, with a sugar that uh, will bind to parts of the brain that are metabolically active. And the, the pattern, how it lights up, can point to different disorders and uh, can help sometimes su uh, with, with supportive evidence to point to you know, Lewy body dementia versus Alzheimer's and others, but it's not an absolute test. I meant, mentioned Huntington disease where you have a genetic test, which, which is as close as to an absolute uh, confirmation as, as it gets. None of the imaging or the neuropsychological evaluation is another one that I would like to mention. It's a multi-hour testing of, uh, uh, of a number of different domains, um, uh, cognitively, memory-wise, the, the language, um, uh, construct, construction uh, abilities, visual uh, hand coordination, and many other domains that will create a profile and that could be somewhat specific to one dementing disorder or another but these are just supportive tests that a clinician will will use to arrive at a diagnosis okay and um john i wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about you've written about this um tell us a little bit about about your book and and what you addressed on this topic so Deborah, you had asked me right before the interview whether I consciously wrote the novel Gray Matters about my father. And, and the truth is I had started writing it before he passed and, and I hadn't intended it to be about him. I had Alzheimer's on my mind and the novel is about a potential early intervention. And sometimes I, we have a certain hubris when we try to remove and cure diseases. It, it's wonderful hearing Dr. Mari talk about how potentially we could get to something before it even starts to manifest. Um, but he described that as something that's far away. Well, sometimes we reach a, a, a little faster than that and we try to come up with a cure and there can be really unintended consequences for hooking people up to, in this case, ultimately artificial intelligence. Um, what's funny about the writing process was, I think it was very therapeutic for me. Even though Deborah, I didn't intend to write a novel about my experience with my father, uh, when you get to the end, 
you must assume that I was unconsciously doing that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's so much else going on that distracted me as an author from recognizing that I was right at the heart of the story, the emotions that are coming across. The, the, the father who has dementia is the only character who has first person point of view chapters, right? It's written through his eyes so you can see how his mind is changing over time. That connects you with him. And of course, as the author, I felt that connection. So I, I loved what an author once said recently, which was that actually fewer novels than you'd think are really autobiographical, but any good novel is very personal. Absolutely. And as when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's gray matters. That's what yeah, I did. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I always like to, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of questions, of course, on diagnosis. I, I take it you need a PET scan. We just talked about it, Dr. Mari, but people are asking like, you know, MRIs. Can you detect anything from, from an MRI? Uh, certainly. Um, and again, uh, just like the, the, the PET scan that I mentioned, uh, MRI is also part of the workup. Um, there are certain disorders that we have to rule out and some of them can produce uh, very clear MRI findings. Now, in Parkinson disease, the MRI is unremarkable. There, there is nothing uh, that stands out and uh, different in a brain MRI in a Parkinson patient from an, any normal control who doesn't have any disease. On the other hand, there are some conditions that can produce very clear MRI changes and structural abnormalities that you can see, but which can also produce signs and symptoms of Parkinson's. And so if there is that concern or a red flag for one of those conditions like normal pressure hydrocephalus or a cerebrovascular disease and strokes, or sometimes um, uh, we can see even some ne neoplasms or, or, or space occupying lesions that can produce symptoms like that. So there, there are many different conditions that could produce an abnormal MRI and ordering it would help you reassure your diagnosis. At the same time, dementing disorders with uh, Alzheimer's, for instance, uh, you mentioned the hippocampus, you can do so-called volumetrics and a, a very detailed analysis to measure the size of the hippocampus and compare it to an age matched population, what it should be. And that gives you a percentile if that's very low, that will be a supportive factor that will point to, to Alzheimer's. So, uh, and, and I mentioned some of the other neurodegenerative disorders such as PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. There is a very clear atrophy of the midbrain. And uh, especially in, or in later stages of the disease that can help this differentiate from Parkinson's and other ones that can clinically look similar. Right. Okay. And I'm mindful of the time here, but I, I always like to end on this question because I am, I think it's enormously helpful. Um, what, uh, first with, with Dr. Mari, uh, give us advice if we are, have a loved one with dementia, what questions should we be asking our doctor to get a better diagnosis? What are things that, you know, are, are the obvious that, that not a lot of us may know? Well, um, I, if, if I had a loved one with dementia, the uh, first thing I would ask the doctor is if they are experienced with uh, diagnosing and managing dementia, but because that could really make a big difference. And uh, I encourage at least for making the diagnosis and setting the care plan on, on a good track, uh, a cognitive neurologist who's specializing in dementia uh, would need to be consulted sometimes not too far out from the diagnosis in part because again there are mimicking conditions sometimes that could be reversible we, we mentioned that right now there are no approved treatments that can reverse or halt the neurodegeneration but some of these mimicking conditions and there are many i can't list them all here but some of them are reversible and treatable the cause can be treatable and missing that is devastating so uh, you need to have an expert who can think of all of those and make sure that you are properly diagnosed and put on the right treatment track so the same thing goes for parkinson's and and Lewy body dementia a parkinson and movement disorder specialist uh, would need to be consulted at least to confirm the diagnosis, make sure that it's correct, and then set the treatment uh, plan on the right track. Okay, and John, enlighten us just through someone who's lived through it. Do you have any advice to give the rest of us? I'll give a very different answer, completely complimentary, uh, which is um, I'm a communication professor, 
And so I would encourage when you do meet with the doctor, with the person who is getting the diagnosis, bring someone else, a family member or a very close friend. You're going to be paying attention to the content of what the doctor says. Have your friend or family member tasked with the responsibility of paying attention to the manner of the doctor. Do they talk to the patient as a person? Do they talk about you and your situation as though it's unique and personal? Or do you feel that you're talking to a website? Do you, is the doctor so detached from this, from maybe from the trauma of it, frankly, uh, that you don't feel they're really going to be able to understand the nuance of your situation? So you pay attention to the content, your, your companion pays attention to the manner, and so you're getting two very different kinds of information at the same time. That's really good advice as well. Thank you so much to both of you. I mean, this is such an important topic. Um, and, you know, I can't tell you how many people write to us, comment on our website about wondering what type of dementia their loved one has. Um, and, you know, one thing that's perfectly clear here is early detection is key to, to a better treatment plan. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Zoltan Mari from Cleveland Clinic, Lou Ruvo Center, and John Gastel. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, as always, we have these interviews um, and sign up for our newsletters on beingpatient.com. Um, the key is that we can um, let you know what's coming up and what your interest is. Always write us, tell us what you want to know about. We go directly to the experts. Thanks very much um, to our guests for this really uh, interesting talk. Thank See you very you much. Time.